Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is the day that the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice and to be glad in it. Want to welcome you all to Dream Big Leadership Church to our Back to Believing Bible study. Amen. Want to thank you God. Thank you all for being here this evening. Amen. Well, we're training today's leaders for tomorrow's problems. We're going to go forward in prayer this evening before we get into the word of God. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you this, this evening, oh God. Alpha and Omega. Creator. God, you're with us. You're for us. And who or what can be a bit against us, oh Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you have rightfully claimed us as your own. So tonight we know whose we are. We know who we are. Thank you, Father, that we've been created and shaped and fashioned in your image. We are your children. Not children of darkness, but children of your dear son. Father, forge us in victory tonight. Even as we open up the word of God, the bread of life, feed our souls and our spirit, O oh Lord. Help us to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. Teach us how to be shaped into the image of our Lord and Savior. Father, teach us how to walk, have favor with you, favor with men, O oh God. The time is approaching. The day is encroaching out of darkness. The hour is being spent as we see the coming of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so God let us not just be religious let this not just be another meeting another sermon but God let tonight be a bringing forth together of our soul and spirit with what the Holy Ghost is doing in this hour whatever you're doing Lord Please don't do it without us. We thank you. We glorify you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Wherever you are this evening, why don't you just lift up your hands and just thank the Lord for who he is and for what he's done. He's an awesome Savior. Amen. Amen. I thank God this evening. Amen. I've been preaching the gospel for since March 2007 and uh, have never, never been tired of preaching it. I thank God for the opportunity to preach, the opportunity to teach, because that's what it is. It's a privilege. And I thank God that he counted, he counted, he counted, he counted me worthy. He's been faithful putting me in the gospel. I thank him for it. In the name of Jesus. Whatever God has made you, you ought to be thankful today. 
in in Jesus name. Amen. So I want to break the bread of life tonight really quickly for those of you all who are watching. I'd love for you to get an instrument of documentation. I learned early I was uh, writing a book. I was writing my first book and uh, the Lord had spoke something to me and I forgot what he said. And uh, he told me, he said, Antoine, I'm never obligated to repeat myself. I'm never obligated. So from that day forward, I record everything. I got something on my phone I can record with. I got a tablet on my desk, in my desk, wherever I'm at, I got something to write with because I want to be a good steward of what God has said. So I want you to do the same thing today, the same thing tonight. Amen. And if you're on, why don't you share this broadcast uh, with somebody tonight? It may not be for them today, but it may be next week. It may be a year from now. I don't know. I was telling, um, um, I forgot who I was talking to. Maybe it was Pastor Ford, that I feel like God has given me more messages for the future. When I mean the future, I don't mean two or three years from now. I mean 15, 20 years from now when the word of God is banned, it's outlawed, and people would have had the responsibility of hiding the word in their heart. And the people get a hold of a Bible or a sermon or something like that. They doing it. They're doing it without the government knowing it, right? And they just might happen to find something you preached, or finding a CD or a tape or a thumb drive, and they hear your words from 2021. So I believe that God has been giving me words for people might not necessarily today, but who's gonna need it in the future? We don't know what's gonna happen when we get raptured up. But we know it's going to be perilous times. Amen. So we want to leave our generation something behind than just more than a sermon. Hopefully it was an impartation and a revelation of who God is. Amen. So I want you to turn to your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. The Lord has been dealing with me heavily on this scripture and in particular on this subject. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. Hallelujah. This message is for all believers, in particular those of you all who may have been marching around the wilderness, walking around Mount Sinai and feel like you haven't progressed. Amen. This message is for you. Let me read the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. This is what the Bible says. This is Paul talking to the church at Corinth. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you that my mouth would be on line with truth. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. And I want to talk to you tonight, at, not as just a pastor, but I want to talk to you tonight as a spiritual, as a spiritual mentor. As a spiritual mentor. I think so many times people have success in God and then they'll talk about the spiritual components of what they've done, but they don't walk people through their life. They don't walk people through the succinct steps that God has given them to help them. They don't talk about it. So tonight, for those of you all who are interested and say, Pastor, I want to go to another level. I know God is speaking to me. I've already got the prophetic word. He's already spoken to my heart. I can feel things lining up around me. And it happens all the time. There's these, there's these frequent visitations. There's these times where God's anointing comes on me. But I'm not going anywhere. They're just moments where I feel good. They're moments of inspiration. But I'm doing the same thing over and over every year. I feel a do come upon my life, but I know I'm supposed to be experiencing the latter rain. 
If that's you, just for a few moments, I promise I'm not going to be long this evening. Very short message. I want you to listen. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, he talks about this word grace. Grace. We hear it a lot in church. It simply means a divine enablement by God. Um, for those of you all who, who weren't here Sunday, uh, just for uh, just a quick moment, I want to talk about grace. And then we'll get into what I wanted to talk about today. So the church needs grace. And it's more than just favor. Grace is a divine enablement by God so that we can walk into our destinies, so that we can um, walk into our purposes. It's a divine enablement whereby we partner with the Holy Spirit, right? We need the grace of God to be upon our life. And there are different graces. And I'll talk about that later on. But there are different graces. But we need them. So for us to be in the church and not be operating under the grace of God, then we're going to be operating in our flesh. There are people who are operating in their flesh and not operating in the grace of God and having success in their flesh, but it's not godly success, right? It's not according to uh, what God has purposed in their life. So we need grace. We see in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, Paul says that I have a grace from God. Number one, and I want to talk to you about four things really quickly we need to understand about grace. Number one, Paul says, this grace that I've been given, it makes me the person that I am. In other words, we are who we are because of God's grace. Paul says, I am what I am. And God's grace has made me that way. I am who I am. Because God's grace has made me that way. So we know that when God graces a man, when God graces a woman, this partnership with grace helps to create the person who you're going to become in the body of Christ. It's not your parents. It's not your school. It's not your college. Those things are supplementary forces that help you in your purpose. But it is when God comes and graces a man or a woman, this grace gives you definition. It says, this is what you do in God. Some of you have a grace to show mercy. Some of you have a grace on your life to do hair. Some of you got a grace for miracles. Some of you have a, a grace for children. Some of you have a grace for business. But whatever your grace is, whatever your thing is, grace makes you. And Paul understood that. Paul says, if I'm going to get started in my life and work for God, I can't do it absent of the grace of God. And that's so important because we have started people in their lives and in ministry and never consulted the Holy Ghost or what they're supposed to be doing. So we were excited that they joined the church. And we put them in the usher ministry. We put them on the deacon board and we, we put them in the helps ministry. And we never consulted God to see what the grace of God wanted them to do. Because remember, it is the grace of God that makes me and you who we are. We are who we are because of God's grace. Number two, this is very important. Number two, grace on your life can be wasted. Grace given by the Holy Spirit can be wasted. Listen to what Paul says. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, he said, I didn't get it in vain. In other words, when God gave it to me, I did something with it. It wasn't in vain. It wasn't for naught. 
I took this grace and I did something with it. And there are um, those of us in the body of Christ who've been spiritually instructed in error, who've been taught that when you get the grace on your life, there's nothing else for us to do. But just wait for God. Just wait for God. And some of us have received grace. We felt the unction. We felt the anointing. We knew there was a divine enablement, but we didn't go do anything. Paul says, when I became graced, when this grace was bestowed upon me, God saw fit to divinely enable me. He said, I made sure that it wasn't in vain. So in other words, my grace that was given me, my grace is meant to do something. So we are who we are because of God's grace. Number two, grace can be wasted. Number three, number three, I want you to take note of this. Grace only meets people who are working. Hallelujah. This is the revelation. This is what I want you to embrace. Grace only meets those who are working. So this is where we have to make a lane change. You may have been taught that God is going to grace. You may have been taught that God is going to grace you. And when he graces you, that's when you'll start. So we got a lot of Christians in the body of Christ to have their hands folded and just saying, when it's my time. You just wait and see what God's going to do through me. And their hands are folded. Their feet are idle. And they're waiting for something that's never going to come. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, this grace made me. This grace was bestowed upon me. And I made sure that it wasn't in vain. How did he make sure that it wasn't in vain? He says, but I... I labored more abundantly than all of them. Paul says, I knew God gave me something that was going to help me in this life. It was going to help me in my assignment and in my lane. He said, and the moment that I recognized that God gave me a grace, I got to work. I want us to hear what Paul is saying. Paul did not say, I know that God was going to grace me. So I sat and I just waited. And when the grace came on me, I just expected that stuff was going to happen. That's not what Paul said. Paul says, I knew a grace was coming because this grace made me the person that I was. And when I found out who I was, I knew I was going to be an unstoppable force in the earth realm. People may not have believed in me. They may not even knew who I was. But I knew that God had given me something precious. And the moment that I found that out, I knew that it was my responsibility to start working. And Paul says not only did he work, he said I worked harder than everybody around me. Now we're talking about Paul, who wrote one third of the New Testament, two thirds of the New Testament. Trained disciples and apostles started churches tutored and mentored, and he was working harder than the people that he mentored. That's right. He was working harder than Timothy and Titus and Priscilla and Apollos. He was working harder because he didn't want God's grace to be wasted. So Paul understood something that I want us to understand tonight. That grace only works when you're working because grace doesn't do it all for you grace partners with you imagine if esther knowing she has to go before king ahasuerus for the deliverance of her people sits back and says i know god has called me to do something I know he's called me to go stand in front of this man, but I know it may cost me my life. 
but I'm not going to get up and move because of fear, because of embarrassment. I'm not going to do it. Imagine if Esther doesn't move, how the story transpires. But what she does do, she understands her lane. She understands her assignment. And she knows that if I just go up and go, grace is going to meet me when I, meet, when I open up the door. She goes in to stand before the king, and the grace works with her to say what she needs to say, and favor is granted. Grace works with you when you go, not when you sit and wait. And there's many people who are called to ministry and are waiting for the grace of God to come upon you for miracles, for signs, wonders, healing. And grace is waiting for you to move. If King David was never practicing fighting tigers, bears, and lions, when he stood before Goliath, he would have killed him. But it was his practice and working with the grace that was on him given by Samuel that he was able to stand before Goliath. And as he picked up his five smooth stones and his, his sling and began to fight Goliath, it wasn't David fighting Goliath. It was the God in David. It was the grace that was on his life. But David still had to go. So grace meets you while you're working. My labor is proof that I believe what God has shown me. You said God called you to be a doctor. He's going to grace you to do it. What's the proof that you believe God? Have you bought the books? Have you went to med school? You said God has called you to pastor. What's the proof that he's called you? How much time do you study? What do you read? Or are you just waiting for something to happen? See, more of us need to tell the other side of the story because you can just get up to a level of success and people just think it's luck. People just think, oh, God just like you better. He favor you. But people don't know that you've been working with grace for years. Proof that I believe what God has said about my life is that I make an investment in the word. I make an investment in the prophecy. And when I get up and go, then the grace starts working with me. We got people in the body of Christ sit, sitting idly by waiting to do something miraculous, waiting to do something supernatural and not moving at all. And you're wondering why there is no grace on your life. Grace works with those who are working. Number four. Grace works with you, not for you. Hallelujah. Grace works with you, not for you. Grace runs with you. Grace does not run the race for you. It is you and grace in your lane. Grace helping you to do things that you can't do in your own natural strength. You've run out of options. Grace opens the door. You've run out of resources. Grace opens the door. You've run out of money. Grace opens the door. But grace works with you, not for you. Paul says, I have this grace. And I'm not going to use this grace in vain. No, I'm not going to let God see that I'm a poor investor in what he's put on the inside of me. He said, but so since I know I got this grace, I tell y'all the mark. I tell y'all how y'all know if I'm graced, I'll outwork you. You'll know a grace is on my life because of what I do. That's what Paul said. Not because how much I can't do. He said, no, you'll know I'm graced because I have an understanding that what's on me is going to give me the ability to multiply my efforts in the earth realm. What it'll take five years for somebody, it'll take two years for me to do. And because I have that understanding, I can do more with less. But I'll outwork you all. That's the sign 
that the grace is on you. And when you're doing it, people can't understand how you're doing it. I wanted to share part of this because God told me in, in, in 2022 that I had more of a responsibility to start telling people how I do stuff. So I, I want to share, not because I'm anybody, but God has given me a measure of success in the spirit and he's given me a measure of success naturally. So I want to share it and still going. Grace works with you, not for you. But if you ever met anybody who has a supernatural grace on their life, they'll tell you the work that they've put in. I was, I was, uh, Mother Gwen, I was, I was sitting in my apartment. I was, I wasn't even, I wasn't in the house. I was sitting in my apartment one day and, um, I was, I, I didn't have any money, but I loved God. I knew him and I knew that he could bless me financially. I didn't know really how it worked, but I, I believed in sowing and reaping. And I kept telling God, God, I'm serving you at this time I was at another church I'm serving you and uh, I'm doing all of these things and I don't see the fruit and I, me- I remember the Lord sitting me down and explaining to me how principles work in the earth realm and he said and I remember God showing me that I needed to get serious about the lane that I was in I want to say that to somebody tonight you call to do something but you're not serious you're not serious You know God has called you to do it, but you don't invest in it. You don't sacrifice in it. For one year of my life, my wife can attest to it, one year of my life, I told the Lord, I said, I want to know how to help people psychologically. He gave me the strategy. One year, every day, for one hour, one year, every day, unless I wasn't feeling well, every hour, while my friends were going to the club, while they were going to parties, while they were going to sleep, hanging out, I was sitting in front of YouTube watching all the top professionals in the world on how they studied the human mind. And as I was studying, I was learning at an accelerated pace. Wasn't that I was smart. It was the grace working with me, seeing that he's putting in his part And a year, after a year, I came out. After a year, I came out. More like you going in and you coming out. I came out. And it was like doors of opportunity began to open. People were calling me, can you come do a workshop on this? Can you teach on that? And supernaturally, I was beginning to teach stuff that I had not even learned. I thought I was just going to be able to teach the stuff I learned. Testimony, not a testimony. I realized that as the grace was working with me, God was giving me supernatural knowledge because of my faithfulness and grace was kicking in. And I was teaching stuff I never even studied. I still do that today. I'm like, where did I learn that from? How do I know that? Remember, you're looking at a person who who, uh, dropped out of the eighth grade, who graduated high school with a 1.5 GPA. The grace. I demonstrated my faithfulness to to the grace that was given me by laboring. I took it serious. And some of you, the only reason that Grace hadn't partnered with you because Grace sees you haven't taken it seriously yet. That's the only reason you start and you stop in Grace. Like, let's keep going. Maybe you haven't devoted enough of your time to your lane. This calling... This job, this lane may require you to give up time with friends, to sacrifice television time. If you want to be graced, if you want to do more with less, if you want to supersede your colleagues, your friends, and your relatives, it calls for sacrifice, and people will ostracize you for it. They will talk about you for it. But when grace partners with you, you will live supernaturally. I'm telling you what I know, not what I read. Yeah. So I, ho- I hear the Holy Spirit saying tonight, tell my people the lane 
that I've graced them for to take it seriously. You preach the gospel, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way the Holy Spirit is going to partner with you. You don't read, you don't pray, you don't fast, no way. You can look for that grace all day long, it's not coming. You're going to have to use your gifts and your talents and the gift of gab. But if you want an anointing that destroys yoke and yokes and if God has called you to that lane, there is a sacrifice that grace is looking to partner with. I don't know what you call to do. He told you to go back to school. You can't go to the party. You can't go to the hangout. There's a sacrifice. And I see so many people failing and they think they're failing because they didn't have enough intelligence, have enough money. And they're going through the, around the same mountain every year. It's not that. There was no labor with your grace. Because somebody told you all you got to do is just sit back and watch God. Because that's what we tell people. Just sit back and watch God. I hear that so much when I'm talking to people now. They just say, Pastor, this my season. Pastor, watch God. Watch him. And I'm like, yes, but I'm watching you. And I don't see you corresponding with what he's going to do. And I sit and I know and I, in the circumference of my heart, I said, they're going to be the same person they was next year that they were this year. And like clockwork, it happens. When Paul said, no, I labor because I know that grace is connected to my labor. So I want to challenge you in this season. What does God call you to do? What's the proof that you believe him? Where's your labor? The labor is proof that you believe him. Hallelujah. Listen to what the last thing Paul says in 15 and 10. He says, I labor more abundantly than you all. But listen, let's not get it confused. But it wasn't me and my flesh laboring. It was the grace that was with me. It wasn't him because I don't want to talk about, I don't want us to be mistaken and you think I'm talking about hustling. I ain't talking about that. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is letting God work through you and working as unto the Lord. Do you know that you can labor and rest? I want to talk about that really quickly because people make mistake what I'm saying by saying, well, pastor, you just got to you asking me to just uh, to work myself to death. That's not what I'm saying. What I am talking about is maximizing your faithfulness. If God has given you an hour, you've maximized it. Right. So you can labor and rest at the same time because we ought to enter into God's rest. We ought not to be worried about the things that we need. Pastor, how can you labor and rest? Rest biblically simply means that you're trusting in God while you're working. But you cannot rest not moving. Rest does not mean immobility. Rest does not mean putting your hand to the plow. It does not. I want to show you something in the word of God. Go to Acts 3 and 7. I want to give you a biblical example of how grace works. Acts 3 and 7. I'm almost done. I told you I was going to be short tonight. Acts 3 and 7. Hallelujah. I have seen people that I knew were anointed. I'm going to share and I'm going to share it before I go to Acts 3 and 7. I, I have seen people that I knew were anointed. Ooh, Tiff, I like that. My God. I have seen people I, I knew that were anointed. And I saw their, their anointing and their giftings and their talents. And I saw mine. And I knew that it didn't match. I knew that I didn't have what it takes because I wasn't from their pedigree, their background. I didn't grow up in church. I was just learning the word. I got born again at 23. I really gave my life to the Lord at 23. I met him at 19, but I started serving him at 23. So according to all of the virtues necessary to be successful, I was behind. 
but I knew I wanted, I knew, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, I wanted to work for God because he was the only person at that time that I could trust who walked me through my adult years. But I saw what it took and I said, God, I don't have none of that. And I grabbed a hold of this, Till, that he would grace me if I worked for him. So I've known people. I've known people. I know. I will never call their names to embarrass them. I know are supposed to be great people in God today. Great men and women of God that are supposed to have manifested their gift right now today. We're supposed to see them on television. Know them in this, in this community. It was supposed to happen. But the fact that they didn't want to clean a toilet. disqualified them for the grace of God. They couldn't, they, they, they had just come out of a revival and they saw how God had used them and they just couldn't imagine that they would need to sweep the floor. Disqualified themselves for the grace. Paul says, I labor more than all of you. I'll clean the toilets. So I learned that, I learned that principle, principle prophet is love. So, what I, what I would do, and Dr. Williams is here. She was at church with me. She'll tell you. I wanted to do everything that everybody else wouldn't do. Amen. So I would get up on Saturday. We had 20 acres of land. I would get up myself to tell my wife I'll be back in a few hours. I'm going to cut all the grass by myself. I'm going to clean the toilets. I would clean the toilets before I go preach. I'm going to wipe the walls. I'm going to serve. I'm going to call. I'm going to, I want to do, I want grace to see that I'm laboring because I know that grace, when it partners with you, it produces. Because I knew another season of my life was coming. And I'm telling you, God has not lied to you about the next season of your life, but there is a preparation to partner with grace. And some people are missing seasons. God keep bringing seasons around. But there is no labor. And I used to be in awe, Mother Gwen. I'm, I'm in awe now with people who I know that are called and can do things like, like be in God's house and like walk past trash or like be in a parking lot. Like when, I come to, like when I come to church on Sundays, that's the first thing I do. I hit the parking lot because I'm thinking, like, this is God's house. What if somebody drove up and saw that trash? Because I was, I've trained myself for years of doing it. Laboring for God's house. And people ignore the small, minute, detailed things of the kingdom and want great grace. He that is faithful will be ruler over many. I'm trying to teach you how to walk in the grace of God. You can't ignore any details. Of, of what God has placed in your lane. Hallelujah. We were in Acts chapter 3 verse 7. I want you to see this. Let me start in verse 6. Y'all have read this parable before. This is the lame man. Let me go to, let me start. Let me start. No, 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 no. Let me start in verse one. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, was asking for a handout. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. He was used to getting handouts. He thought Peter and John was going to give him another handout. Then Peter said, I know you're used to handouts, but I want to teach you how to fish. I want to give you a fish. Silver and gold... I don't have any of that. 
but I do have something more precious than that. Such as I have, I give thee. What did he give them? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I want you to notice in verse 6, the man doesn't move. Peter and John just told him to rise up and walk, but he's so used to people giving him handouts. He's so used to people taking care of him. He's so used to being in an atmosphere where he's used to people working for him and him not working for himself. He didn't even recognize when his miracle had come. Grace was at the doorstep of his deliverance and he doesn't move in verse 6. Peter and John having the discernment of God. I want you to see what you've never seen between verses 6 and 7. He doesn't move move in verse 6. The Bible says Peter, recognizing this man don't even realize this is his opportunity. He don't even realize this is opportunity where grace wants to meet him. Listen to what verse 7 says. I want you to see this yourself. Peter says he ain't moving, so let me help him. And he took him by the right hand. And he lifted him up. Who did that? Peter. Peter's flesh did that. And the moment the man began to rise, listen to what the word of God, the word of God says. Immediately grace came. The Bible says his feet and his ankle bones received strength. Now, while he was sitting still in verse 6, he never received strength. But the moment he began to get up and rise, grace met him. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the only reason grace hadn't met you because you hadn't got up. The Bible says in verse seven, he took him by the right hand, which is the right, which is the hand of fellowship. He lifted him up. Immediately his feet and ankle bones Receive strength. And when the grace came upon him for his healing, he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And for those who have had a real encounter with grace, when you know you've done something that you couldn't do in your own strength. For, let, let me rephrase that. For those of y'all who doing stuff. And you know it ain't your own strength. There is no way you're supposed to be living how you're living. There is no way your body's... There was no way. There is no way you're supposed to be doing what you're doing. There is no human physical way. For those who walk, who walk with grace, I ain't worried about happiness. Because grace is a reprodu- reproductive symptom of joy. So people will look at you and say, why are you always up, always excited? Because they don't know all day long you've been walking with grace. You've been doing stuff you're not supposed to do. What was said to you was supposed to steal your peace. It was supposed to steal your mind. What the doctor said to you was supposed to take you out. But it has not up to this point. Grace is walking with you. Let me tell you how, let me tell you how grace will flirt with you. Just to give you an introduction of itself. Have you anybody ever been riding in a car before? Because God always wants you to have what you need. Have you ever been riding in a car before? Maybe it's not this specific situation. This happens to me. Maybe it's just my situation. You ever been riding in a car before and you knew you had like 15 minutes to get to that place? Yeah. And as you're driving, you know it was 15 minutes. But as you're driving, you've, dri- you've driven five, six, seven miles. And only like one minute has passed. And you're like, I know I've been driving longer than. That's grace flirting with you. Because grace has the ability to to disrupt the fabric of time. Grace has the ability to, to intervene where doctors have gone ignorant. So grace will flirt with you. But imagine somebody who walks with grace continually always having those things happen. 
And so it's Paul's admonition to us in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. I understand that grace can take me to supernatural levels in life. So I always need to make sure grace finds me laboring. Grace always finds me working in my lane for God. Grace is never going to catch me sleep. Grace is never going to keep. Grace is never going to keep. Is never going to keep me out of the will of God. That's what Paul says. So Paul begins to walk with his grace so much that God says, "I can trust you. I see how you work for me. I see how you go into hostile territory, and they meet you in the middle of the night." And they bind you up and take you to the Sanhedrin council and they try to steal your life. I see how you go by, by night into ships with men that don't know you. And the enemy sends, sends uh, torrential storms and rain to try to kill you. And how you're thrown overboard. How you're shipwrecked at sea. How scorpions and snakes come out to kill you. God says, I see how you continue to do that without ceasing. I see how I've, you've asked me to remove this thing in your life three times. And I haven't removed it. I just told you my grace was sufficient for you. And you keep going on anyway. He says, I see you. And I trust you so much that I'm going to give you a vision of heaven. And Paul says, there was one day, there was this man who was in the body, out of the body, I do not know. But he was caught up into the third heavens. And he saw stuff that people are not even supposed to see as human beings. Because he had walked with grace so much. You're not winning because you're not partnering with grace. So how do I walk in grace, Pastor? Four things. Simple, quick. Number one. You got to find out who you are. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 to 10, I am that I am by the grace of God. You got to find your lane quick. What's your role? Quick. Because grace is only partnering. It's only partnering with those that are in their lane. God's not anointing you for your own selfish desires. God doesn't anoint a person just so you can be famous, so you can be uh, uh, the center of attention, so, so you can be uh, uh, a person who, who um, uh, everybody wants to see, so, so you can get the hand claps and praises. No, that's, why not a per- that's not why God anoints a person. God anoint- anoints you for a function in the kingdom. So if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing and you just having church, you just living and existing, you can forget having grace. God will give you mercy. That's brand new every morning. Grace is different. Yes, it is. Grace, is, grace is a divine ability to do your role in the kingdom. This has nothing to do with flesh. It gives you the ability to succeed above your colleagues. Daniel had a grace on his life. The Bible says Daniel was preferred above presidents, mayors, officials, governors, because there was a grace called excellence. Said an excellent spirit was found upon him. That was a grace. He had a, he had a grace to excel above his peers. It was a grace that was on him. And go look at Daniel's life. You want to talk about a man that worked for God. He worked for three kings. Da- Daniel outlived three kings. And served them all faithfully. There wasn't anything happening politically in those kingdoms that Daniel wasn't a part of. Daniel was like, oh, well, yeah, I think I'm just going to take a couple years off. I'm tired. There's no such thing as retirement in the body of Christ. Don't let the world fool you. We don't retire. We walk out of the sunset with the angels holding our hands and go into glory. In our assignment. I hope I die with the mic in my hand. I'm going to do a teaching later on. I'm still working on it. But I want to teach us about the four phases of life. The Holy Spirit has been dealing with me. There was a morning phase, an afternoon phase, an evening phase, and there was a midnight phase. And those are in 25-year increments. And all those 25 years, God delineates in the Word of God what we should be doing with our assignment. I'm going to teach y'all that. The Holy Ghost has been teaching me that. 
Some of you are in 25. Some of you are in year 50. Some of you are in 65. There is assignment in every quarter of those lives. Amen. So I have to find out who I am. What's my lane and what's my role? And I stick to it. The grace is only coming when I'm in my lane. Don't get jealous of what somebody else is doing. That's not your lane. Everybody didn't call you to teach. You might not be called to do hair. You might not be called to preach. You, you, you might not be called to be an educator. You might not be called to be a doctor. What's your lane? When you find your lane, the grace connects. And so we don't compete, but we complete each other. We celebrate each other's gifts. Amen. Number one. Number two. I'm almost done. Number two. When I find out what my role is, what my lane is, I must get ready to labor with an intensity that supersedes those around me. Yes. You got to be ready to work harder than everybody else because the only reason, the only way uh, uh, that grace, the only way that grace works with you is that it finds you working hard. And the harder you work, the harder grace works. So you're actually not working hard. It's grace working with you. But you got to give grace something to work with. So if you want to excel in the kingdom of God, listen to me. If you want to excel, not in just the kingdom of God, I'm, this works anywhere. Because I've, I've been in, in business and play. If you want to, I've been all the way to the top. All the way to the top. If you want to excel, been, and I've been all the way to the bottom. If you want to excel, out work and out faith people. Yes. Have more faith in them and outwork them. Yes. Outwork them. They leave it for you, leave it 4.30. What God would do, would, would do for you between 4 and 4.30 would be more than what they've done between 8 and 4, I promise you. Yes. I'm going to say that again, just the Bayou State, you let that get by you. What, what you do, when they leave it 4, if you stay between 4 and 4.30, what the grace will allow you to do between 4 and 4.30 will be more than what they did between 8 and 4. I'm telling you, I'm telling you from somebody who rose through the ranks and wasn't even supposed to be at the table. Because I understood that if you're not, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. I said, God, I always got to be at the table. Yes. Grace working mightily in me. You got to outwork people. You got to kill the spirit of procrastination. You got to kill the spirit of laziness. It will rob you of your destiny. Yes. You, will video, you will video your game, video game yourself right out of your prophetic anointing. You will Netflix yourself right out, of, right out of your pastoral grace. I'm telling you what I know. I work with people every day of my life. I work with at least three or four people every day of my life. I'm mentoring, pastoring, counseling at least four or five people every day. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you the people who come to me and say, Pastor, if I would have known what I knew now, I wouldn't have sacrificed my family for this. If I know what I knew now, I wouldn't have sacrificed my ministry for hanging out with my friends. If I knew what I knew now, Pastor, I would have done it differently. I'm telling you what I know. If they could start it all over again, they would have been super focused on the thing God called them to do. But they got distracted with drugs and alcohol and women and the cares of this world. They got distracted. And by the time they were ready to do the thing that God called them to do, their natural strength was fading. They didn't have the energy. They were tired. They had to go to bed at 8 when they could stay all the way up to 1 o'clock. The Bible says, young people, work in your youth. So when you get old, it's about legacy. It's about passing it forward. Now, I know there are situations where our, our youth gets robbed from us by our parents and the cares of life, things that happen. God uh, supernaturally uh, gives us, uh, helps us to work in different time frames and dimensions. But I'm talking to those of you all who can hear me now when you're young. There's no such thing as young Hallelujah. So I got to work with an intensity. Somebody was telling me, I hear this all the time, Pastor, you doing too much. And I always, my, my, my statement is always saying, I'm not doing enough because I know what God has given to me. I can't, I can't look at other people and say, well, that's all they doing, so I'm doing this. So I'm, no, no, no. I know the grace that's on me. I know the grace that's on me. A lady was telling me the other day, you pastor the church and you over a, a organization for the state and you a husband and you and you a full-time parent and you and you got a business and, and you do all that. That ain't too much. It's not enough. Because every time I add something to the plate, mother, I feel grace kick in. I shut up by Kosa. The moment I don't feel the grace is when, is when I've learned that's not what I'm supposed to do. 
If the grace doesn't come with me, I don't put it on my plate. If I put it on, if I go into it, because I got to go into it first. If I go into it and I feel that supernatural anointing, it's on the plate. Some of you got a grace you've never tapped into. I feel this for somebody listening to me. You're doing all this in your natural strength. That's why you're failing. No grace. No grace. You can do more than what you're doing now with the grace of God. Do you know the grace of God will let you sleep at night and exponentially improve your life while you sleep? You'll wake up to phone calls, emails, text messages. You say, where does this come from? Grace was working for me. I decree and declare a grace over your life, Mother Gwen. A grace over your life, Prophet is love. Phaedra, a grace. Tiff, a grace to do more with less. People will know you are graced because they'll say, how in the world is she doing that? How in the world? And I hope you give God glory. I hope you say, it's just a grace. It's just a grace. Number three, when the grace is working with me, number, number three, I must develop a divine strategy. I must develop a divine strategy. I'm not going to go to it, but I want you to write the scripture down. Oh, I forgot to write it down. Maybe y'all already know it. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Hold on a second. I got to find it because I want you to write it down. Ecclesiastes uh, 5 and 3. I always want to say 5 and 15. Ecclesiastes 5 and 3. Listen, don't be duped. Ooh, don't be duped. Please, 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 please. Don't be fooled. Don't be tricked into believing because you heard a word, because you heard a prophecy. Because somebody spoken to your life that is automatically coming to pass. That is not true. Nope. That is not. It is not. It is not. Ezekiel 33. God says, I look for a man to stand in the gap so that I would not pour out my indignation. But I couldn't find one person who was on, on, the, on the prayer call. I couldn't find one person who was standing in the gap. So he said, I had to pour out my indignation upon the people. God was looking for somebody who was in that lane of intercession when they was watching Netflix. Listen to what Ecclesiastes 5 and 3 says. For a dream, a prophecy, an open vision, a closed vision, it comes through the multitude of sitting there with your hands folded. Of waiting for God to come down in the form of a dove and anoint you. I'm so glad he didn't put this word different in the Greek because we all know what that word means. Through a multitude, multitude, many ways of doing what? Business. And listen to the B part. You know you're talking to a fool because this is the person always saying, God going to do it. That's all they say. Oh, you just wait and see. He going to mightily use me. And their hands are folded. The Bible says if you fold your hands, there's a little sleep, a little slumber, and then poverty comes on you like a thief. The fool says, if I just talk about it, it's going to happen. But the person who understands this message I'm preaching, who understands grace, says, no, I, w I have business to attend to. You tell them, I can't go to the mall. I can't go to the party. I can't hang out over there. I got business with God. He showed me in a dream. I saw myself preaching to thousands. I saw myself laying hands on the sick so they're going to recover. So I'm going to go lock myself away. I saw myself with businesses, but I said for a year, I'll lock myself in my room and I'll just read books, study. I'll watch YouTube. I'll, I'll do it for a year. And they were like, Twan, where you at? Twan, where you at? I'm locked into business. And my dream came to pass. I now can walk in the room and start talking and make money. That's not bragging. I'm not saying that to impress you. I'm trying to impress upon you that that just went no luck. That just went God just like him. No, that came through a multitude of business and walking with grace. For 12 months straight, 
just doing that. And you got the same grace available to you. So you got to ask God for a strategy. The Bible says he who sits down and desires to build a tower and does not plan first, does not plan first. If you fail, people going to mock you. He who sits down to build a tower, the Bible says, without counting the cost. If you don't have, I'm giving you the King James now. If you don't have sufficient to, uh, to finish it, then people will mock you and say, look at this fool who did all that talking and ain't got nothing to show for it because the grace weren't working with you. You didn't have a strategy. You just thought God was going to do it. Let me say this really quick and, 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 and then I'm going to come to an end. Grace helps you to understand spiritual laws. What do you mean, Pastor? You can have enough anointed oil on you to defry you like a chicken. But if you get on the top of this building and you jump with your anointed self, there's a law that's going to snatch your tail up. Call gravity. It don't care how anointed you are. So if you do that and you're not partnering with the grace, and you just want to ignore the law because just because you heard a prophecy, just because you had a dream, you're going to be sadly mistaken. So grace is working, waiting for us to get a plan to partner with wisdom and say, God, I heard you say this is my destiny. What do I need to do? The spirit of wisdom say, OK, go down there and register for the class. Don't worry about it. I know you struggled in high school. I'm grace. I'm with you. You're going to pass. Don't worry. He says, I know you've been staying in this apartment. You want a home. I, I know you don't have the credit score. That's all right. Just go apply. I'm with you, Grace. But there must be a systematic plan. That's what's wrong with the church. We want God to do stuff and we don't have a plan. We want, we want, we want God to give us money with no vision. He'll never do it. He's not just going to bless you supernaturally with finances so you can go get another purse. Amen. He's not just going to bless Dream Big if, if the vision is not to win souls. It's not going to happen. So I got to have a divine strategy. Somebody say a divine strategy. Why do I need a divine strategy? A divine strategy keeps you focused every day. Please, please listen. You listening to me by Facebook. Please, if you've been called by God, please don't ever get up in your day and not have anything to do. Please, please, please. Please don't let your day go by and you don't know where it went. Please. One of the most beautiful things my apostle taught me, I was about 25. She said, Pastor, I sense greatness on you. She said, but you're a procrastinator. She was honest with me. That's how I knew she loved me. People that not, not, that's not honest with you, they don't love you. They don't. She said, but I want you to learn something. She didn't just judge me. She taught me. She said, she gave me something that stuck with me, and I went from a procrastinator to a planner. People pay me to go into their, into their businesses and teach them how to strategize. I learned that because I was humble enough to accept what she told me and a grace fell on me. This is what she told me. She said, our pastor, I want you to learn to prioritize the precious minutes of the day. It took me to another level. I'm from the streets. I, had, I, had, I was never worried about. I, when I went to college, I, was, I missed so many classes I never knew when they started. I was never mindful of time. I was never mindful of time. I barely graduated. Never mindful of time. I was early on in my marriage. Nearly failed. Never mindful of the time. She taught me. Prioritize the precious minutes of the day. And I saw that life was like 24 golden box carts. And when you get up in the morning, you got 24 hours that God has given you because I learned something in principle. Those that you, you listen to me today, I'm telling you, your life will change. I learned in principle that my life, my life was not my past, present, and future. No, it's not. No, it's not. Your lifetime is your past, present, and your future. Your life is today. Amen. You're only given today. He only promised today. He didn't promise tomorrow. So I understood that principle. I said, I got 24 hours, and I learned to plan my time by the hour. If you talk to me too long, I start moving because I already know what the next hour is going to be like. So I learned to plan my day from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. It's never, it's, never, it's never without anything that's constructive. If it's spending time with my kids, if it's reading the world, I'm not going to be idle. And if I move into idleness, I feel the grace of God say, we ain't getting nothing accomplished and I move out. 
You got to plan your rest. You got to plan your recreation. You got to plan your family time. But just to be have to be twiddling your thumbs and getting nothing done in your calling, I'm telling you, it is it is it is the grace of God that Paul described in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. It is the grace of God in vain, and that grace will leave you. You got to be constructive. Every hour has got to be planned. Sometimes I don't even answer the phone when people call me because I'm in an hour that doesn't include you. People get mad when I say that. But I know what that hour entail. It didn't entail talking to you. I'm working for God. I'll call you when I get to your hour. Now, if you want me to change that, pay my phone bill. I promise I'll call every time you call. You answer. You call. I answer every time you call. You pay it. I pick it up like clockwork. But until, until then, I prioritize the precious minutes of the day. Single people, non-working people, you ought to have a grace on you to get stuff done. You ought to be running circles around married people. The Bible says those that are single care for the things of the Lord. Those that are married care how they're going to please their spouse. If you're single, if you single, you listen to me. If you single, there should be such a grace on you. You should be working circles around people. Because your time, your time is different. But it's graced. And that, don't all, and, and that doesn't always mean that you, you're running around. That may mean you in prayer. You fasting. You praying for somebody. But, uh, yeah, I wonder what they got on. It's young and arrested. Let's, let's, let's see. I don't think they do. I just, the first thing came to my mind. I ain't watched TV in seven years. I don't know why they, I don't know what they, they be asking me about these shows. Y'all with me when I say that though? It's for somebody 10 years from now. You're listening to me. Last but not least. I have to learn the difference between me working in my strength and working in the grace. There's a difference between your strength and working. You have to work in your strength. You start in your strength. But you finish in the grace. I start in my strength. But I finish in the grace. Because remember what Paul said in our foundation scripture. It's not I, but it's the grace of God working in me. So that's why as a child of God, you can't be scared to get into anything God told you to do. Because you might start in it ill-equipped. You might start in it without the knowledge, without the money. It's all right. You won't finish that way. So Isaiah said, here am I. Send me, Lord. My pastor taught me something a long long time ago. He said, Antoine, God will give you more along the way than when you first get started. You just got to get started. And somebody listening to me today, you haven't got started. Because you're waiting for the grace first. And I'm telling you, it's not coming until you get up, pick up your mat, and start walking. So I pray this evening I'm finished for those who are watching. Hallelujah. That you would get up, get out, and get something. That the grace of God may partner with you on your journey to greatness. I pray today that your labor be not in vain. That we don't take God's grace for granted. That tonight we decide, we decide by an act of our free will to move for God. I decree and declare that as you move for God tonight, that grace will meet you in your bedroom. Grace will meet you in your vehicle. There will be a divine enablement for you to excel wherever you are. People will see the noticeable difference in your life because you are redefining what success looks like 
for your family tree. You are altering the course of success in front of your kids. They say, Mama, how are we doing this? Daddy, how are we doing this? Your colleagues will be astounded. Your family members and your relatives will be in awe. And you'll tell them, it's the grace of God working within me. It's the grace of God working within me. In the name of Jesus. Listen, maybe some of you watching today, those of you in the sanctuary with me, please be praying in your prayer language. But those of you all watching today, you may be watching me and you've never, you've never seen the Son of God. You've never met him face to face. The Bible says in Romans 10 and 9, if you confess the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then there is salvation for you. But there is no salvation in any other name than the name of Jesus. If that's you, we, in, we, we offer you Christ today. We offer you Christ today. Turn away from your sins. Turn to him. He died on the cross so that there is eternal life for you. If that's you this evening, we want to meet you. We want to help you. If that's you and you responded, the only reason you're responding is because the Holy Ghost is pulling on your heart. The Word of God says no man comes to God unless you draw him. So if he's drawing you, we want to partner in that effort. Contact us. I want to make sure your salvation is foolproof. 318-402-4838. Call us. Email us. Message us. We want to know who you are. We want to walk you through your salvation and then teach you how to follow him. That's the next step. If you need prayer, there's anything that's going on in your life. We got prayer warriors in the sanctuary today. We're praying for you. We send the word. Healing. Deliverance. Whatever you need, we send the word in the name of Jesus. Some of you need to get to this sanctuary. We got people of God in this house that God is assigned to break the yokes off of your life. But the enemy keeps you at home. Pastor asking you to come. Not because we need the church for it. Not because, not because we need money. I don't take a salary. We don't need any of that. God takes care of the church so that you so that fruit can abound to your account. God has assigned people in the body of Christ to help you. And those of you all who are watching me and you out of your lane, we need you back in your lane. Everybody just said, I'm praying. I'm praying for you. No, work for God for somebody. You at home praying. That's good. Work for God. We send a word to you tonight. If you need a church, this may not be the church, but you need to be a part of somebody. We pray for you tonight. If this is the place, God will tell you. He'll tell us. We love to have you. We love for you to partner with us, to work with us as we work for God. And we bring the salvation of Jesus to a dying generation. There is a leader in you. There is a leader in you. And we want to help bring it out in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Amen. We thank you so much for listening, for being with us. Amen. We just thank God for being God, the Son of God, manifested in the flesh, risen. We call him Lord. We call him Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus. We thank you for watching tonight. Listen, I want to invite you to be back this Sunday after Thanksgiving meal. I got a word from the Lord. The power of God is going to be in the sanctuary Sunday. I promise you, you won't be here. I promise you, everything is going to happen for you not to get here. But the Lord, we're going to meet the Lord here in the sanctuary Sunday. We want you to be here. Amen. The kingdom of God is not in word only, but in power and in demonstration of the spirit. And for those of you all who celebrate Thanksgiving, don't forget to thank God from whom all blessings flow. While the cranberry, while the cranberry sauce is falling from your cheeks, don't forget to give God thanks. Amen. As you get older, like me, when I was young, I didn't really think about it, but now I feel old. You know, you just be grateful to see a hol another holiday roll around. You know, you see another one come around, you have more gratitude. 
Amen. When you were young, it's just like, oh, oh, it's, it's another year. Oh, oh, you 18 year olds going to find out what I'm talking about. Yeah. When stuff start cracking and moving and making noise. And I was going up the stairs the other day, probably love. And I told Pat T, I said, we got to fix these stairs. All I heard was crack, crack, crack. I said, I know this thing ain't loose. Faye, this is my dog on knees. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I kid you not. My knees. So when that start happening, you just be grateful. But it's all right. Though the outward man perish, the inner man is being renewed day by day. So my spirit to tell that leg, come on up here. Come on up these stairs. Amen. So I'm just saying be grateful. That's all. People be grateful for houses and cars and all that stuff. You, you turn 40. You be grateful for a great doctor's report. Amen. Be grateful you still got your strength and you can run around with your children. Your gratitude shifts. That's all I'm saying. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to stand to your feet. Amen. Phaedra, come up here and do prayer and benediction. I'll give Phaedra a hand of praise. That's the name. As long as you call on that name, you're going to be good. Hallelujah. Lord, just thank you for this word that we've had, Lord. I just thank you that it don't fall on dry ground, God. Lord, I thank you that it touched the people that it needs to be touched, God, Lord, that they will know and hear and take heed to everything that was said, Lord, and move a little bit forward and leave, move a little bit higher into their purpose, God. And I just ask you to continue to bless us as we keep your word on in our hearts, Lord, and touch the man of God that actually received the Lord, give him a hundredfold and, and give him his strength and restore everything that he's put out back in him a hundredfold, God. And I just ask you to continue to bless us as we seek your face like never before and continue to bless us as we leave this place, but never your presence. It's in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.